A quick review um, wouldn't hurt. <laughs> it never does, does it? It never does. The part that com was confusing to me was the absorption and emission part, like the color color part. The electron shell part to me made a little bit of sense. But the okay, so what what is it about uh, the color part? Like the when she in the second video when she had the two like color charts and then mm -hmm. one was like black with little strips of color and then one was colored with little strips of black that was kind of confusing like i didn't understand what that was oh right yeah because one one is an emission spectrum uh -huh. where you see the little uh, the, the the lines mm -hmm. just the sort of the black background with the, with the with the white lines and the other is an absorption spectrum where you basically with white light you get all the colors whoa <laughs> you get all the colors, but then certain elements will only absorb certain wavelengths, and those appear as like black lines. So it's basically there's, there's two separate things. So, um, well, actually, why, why don't I just I'll just go over a, a, a few slides, and we can just talk about it. Would, would that be a good way to proceed? Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. No problem. No problem. Let's see, where would be a good place to start? Um, <laughs> okay. Let's start here. All right, so this basically sort of picks up at, 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 at the point where um, it was initially discovered that light being emitted from, from atoms is at very specific wavelengths. And that said something really important um, because if you just got white light coming, coming from atoms, that would mean that basically all energies are, are available that there's just basically an infinite number of, of, of energy levels. And so when, when um, light is emitted, and remember, light is emitted when first we excite electrons in, 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 in the atom. And so the electrons are excited up to higher energy levels. And when they fall back, they emit that re uh, radiation in the form of light. So that's how we can sort of get uh, some kind of information about what these different energy levels are. And if so, if there was just an infinite number of them, they could just move basically anywhere, we would see all wavelengths um, coming out from individual atoms. We would just see white light coming from every atom, but we don't, we don't see that at all. We see very specific wavelengths. And because the wavelength is related to the energy, that tells us something really important. That tells us there's very specific energy levels of electrons in the atom. So that was like the first sort of, you know, eureka uh, moment from in, in, in the atomic age. It's like, wow, there is very specific defined levels that these electrons can go to. They can't just go anywhere. There's, they go to very specific places. And that was um, Rainberg's uh, first uh, acknowledgement of that. He was the first one to sort of work out all of the, this is the um, emission spectrum from hydrogen. So if you take hydrogen gas and you put like electricity into it to excite the atoms and then see what light comes out, you get these very defined patterns. So this is an emission spectrum where you see like a, a black background and you see light with very specific wavelengths. And he noticed that you could, you could define these with a really simple equation. And um, just using N1 and N2, which would be, which would be integers. So basically that was, that was the thing that like put a light on a Bohr's, Niels Bohr's head saying, 
Oh, there must be energy level one, and two, and three, and four. So we took Rindberg's analysis and said, that must be how hydrogen works. So here's Bohr's explanation. We've got all of these different energy levels. And they're pretty simple. So we just have one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. And so when an electron falls all the way from an outer level, all the way back to the beginning, like this one here, that's a lot of energy being lost. And so that's a very high um, energy uh, photon or, 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 or particle wave of, of light. So that would be energetic. That would be ultraviolet it's when it falls from a very high level all the way to the ground state. But then you have all these other things that could take place too. You could fall from six to five, or you could fall from five to four, or you could fall from six to four. And what um, Bohr did was calculate all these energies very, very precisely and then worked out what these distances must be. And they worked out perfectly. And so he won, he won a Nobel Prize in I think like 1914 or 1915 because his prediction matched exactly what, the, what, the, what, what we saw from the hydrogen atom. So it's like, this is great. Um, this must be how everything works. Yay. Except there's a problem. And that problem is when you look at basically anything else. So here's the emission spectrum for carbon, nitrogen, neon, magnesium, just some other atoms. And you can see they get hideously more complicated. And when you tried to use Rindberg's equation, it didn't work anymore. So basically Bohr's hypothesis of just there being single energy levels, one, two, three, four, five, break down the minute you get anything more complicated than hydrogen. And we know there's, you know, atoms are a lot more complicated than hydrogen. They have two electrons and five and six and 10 and 50. And so that doesn't work anymore. And so we needed a new uh, hypothesis. We needed a new model that explained everything more complicated than hydrogen. And that's where our boy, uh, Erwin Schrodinger comes along. So his new theory was that electrons aren't just particles. You can't treat them as particles that, that move this far from the nucleus to this far, to this far, to this far. But be, because they're energy, we must treat them as waves as well. And this was the big mind blowing um, conceit of, of, of Schrodinger that people Einstein, for instance, does not, did not accept this at the time. It took him about 10 years to come around to, oh man, Schrodinger's right. Um, so don't feel bad if, 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 if you don't understand it. Einstein didn't understand it at first. And so what Schrodinger said was, if you treat electrons as waves, there are different equations we can use between waves and particles. Particles define or um, act in a very specific way. They're here or they're here, or they're here, very defined. But waves move like this. They don't have, um, we can't predict exactly where they're gonna be at any one time. And so he used a wave equation rather than a particle equation. And he said that the energy levels must be more complicated than just what particles can do. And don't feel bad if you don't understand the Schrodinger's <laughs> equation. Here's someone who's obviously way too into it. I don't get it. It's, it's really complicated math. But it breaks down rather simply that, I know it doesn't, it doesn't look very simple right now. But don't worry about it. You won't have to, to know this equation. But when you plug numbers into this equation, what happens is that you define probabilities. Now, this is a probability of where we would find the electron in hydrogen at its when it's in its ground state, when it's at its lowest energy. And so what Schrodinger's equation predicts is that we would find the most obvious place or the, the place that that electron spends most of its time is around this far. And it's 
a circular distribution that looks like this. So this is what it would look like. So this is the ground state um, electron. We're gonna find it in a circular pattern around the nucleus and it's most likely, and it gets more and more likely we find it closer and closer we get to the nucleus. And so this is what the very first energy level looks like. It looks like, a sh that's why we call them shells because they basically look like a shell around the nucleus. So that's why we call these, the, these um, energy levels energy shells, because they look like this. And then when we get further away, they just get bigger. So the second energy level is a little, is a little further away. And it, oops, let me go back. And it's most likely to be this far away from the nucleus. And then the next energy level, we most likely will find it this far away from the nucleus. But notice that these are all distributions. These aren't just one single place where it can be. That's what Bohr said, that it has to be at exactly this position. And Schrodinger says, well, that's the most likely place we'll find it, but we can also find it in some other places as well. But Schrodinger's equation agreed with Bohr's uh, uh, predictions as well. So this made sense. Where it got a little more complicated when we started looking at other more complex atoms. So let me just go to, so we need four different numbers to define each individual electron. And the first one is just these shells that I, that I mentioned before. One, two, three, four, and five. That basically just says that all that number is, is how far away is the electron from the nucleus? If it's one, it's close. If it's two, it's further. Three, it's further. Four, so on and so forth. So those are pretty straightforward. Now, so that we call N or the principal. Oops, let me go back. That is the principal quantum number. Damn it, go back there. And that is just, so that's the same as a shell, which says how far away is the electron from the nucleus. So that is just the principle, just that's the shell, how far is it? So we call that a shell or an energy level. We can use those terms interchangeably. Now the other ones tell you, give you more information about where that electron is. So the first one is just the shell. The second one tells you what shape the subshell is. So we have shells, and then we have subshells, which are basically the different shapes that electrons can travel in inside the shells. And so that is L. And L can starts at zero and can be zero, one, two, three, four, all the way up to whatever shell you're in, minus one. Meaning that if you're in N shell, shell number one, the only um, subshell you can have is L equals zero. And we call that S, we call that the S subshell. If you're in the second um, uh, shell, that means that L can now be either zero or one. And when you're in the third subshell, you can be zero, one, or two. So basically what the principal quantum number tells you, that tells you how many subshells can exist inside. If it's one, you can only have one. If it's two, you can have two different subshells. If it's three, you can have three. If it's four, you can have four. And luckily there's only four that we need to, um, to know. So basically L just goes up to three. Zero, one, two, three, okay? And we'll just go over what those, sh what those look like.
Now, M to the L just says where in the subshell is it? So subshells have these like weird shapes and there's lots of different places inside the subshells it, 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 it can be. And M just tells you where it is. Basically, that is where the orbitals are. So we have shells. How far away is it? We have subshells. What kind of shape is it? Then we have orbitals. Where in those weirdly shaped things am I going to find the electron? So this has values of minus L to plus L. So what does that mean? That means if I'm in the S subshell where L equals zero, the only orbital is zero. Because there's only place, there's only place or spaces for two electrons in an S subshell. That's it. There's only two of them. And there's only one place it can be. So that's it. If, however, we go, what's anyone remember what the next subshell is after S? We go yeah. S. P, right, P. So P, L equals one. Now, where can we find an electron in a P subshell? Three places, how do we know it's three places? Because it can either be minus one, zero, or plus one. So there's one, two, three places for that electron to be. What's next after P? We have S and then P, then what's the next one? D. D, right. D, L equals two. Well, how many places can we find an electron in a D sublevel? We start at minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, plus two. That means there's one, two, three, four, five places to find electrons. And so if there's five places to find electrons and there's two electrons in each, in each place, that means it can hold 10 electrons. P has three places to hold electrons, minus one, zero, and plus one. Each one of those is an orbital. And so since there's three orbitals and two electrons each, it can hold six electrons. So we have S, P, D, and what's the last one? What is it? F. F, that's right. F is when L equals three. That's the biggest one that, 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 that we know of, or that we need to explain the periodic table. So F, L equals three. So how many places are there in, in an F? How many orbitals in an F subshell? Minus three, minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, plus two, plus three. That means one, two, three, four, five, six, seven orbitals in an F subshell. Two electrons each, that's 14. And so as we increase, every time we, every time we go up uh, a subshell, we add another two orbitals. One on the negative side, one on the plus side. So S has zero, that's the location. P has minus one and plus one on either side with a zero, so it is three. D has minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, plus two, so it is five. And then F has minus three, minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, plus two, plus three, for a total of seven. So those are what we call the magnetic quantum numbers. The magnetic quantum number tells you which orbital it's in. Where can I find it? And then finally, the simplest one of all is the spin number. It's the fourth one. And there's only two things it can be. Why? Because this tells you, once you've got past the shell, the subshell, the orbital, once you're inside the orbital, there's only two electrons can be there. That's it. So with the spin number, we're only talking about two electrons. Are you the first one into the orbital or the second one into the orbital? If you're the first one in by yourself, 
your spin is plus one half. If you're the second one in and fill that orbital, your spin is minus one half. And that's why we see up and down. When we're filling in these orbitals, that's the first, if there's only a single electron in there, we say it has an up spin, plus one half. And if there's two in there, the second one in has a minus spin. And we say that's minus one half. Now this will have an effect on magnetism. And that's a little confusing because the first, the last, the, the where the orbital is is called the magnetic number. And the spin is actually the thing that, that will define magnetism. And we'll get, we'll get to that a little bit later. But basically what that means is if you have an element that has a lot of orbitals with single electrons in them, and they're all pointing up in the same direction, all spinning in the same direction, that is a magnetic element. So something like iron has, I think, either three or four unpaired electrons all spinning in the same direction. And so that's why iron is magnetic. Okay, so let's just look at a couple more and then, then, then we'll get started. So this is just putting everything, yeah, putting everything together. So how many electrons can we find in each individual shells? Well, you look at the principal number that tells you the shell. That also will tell you, so if the first one is one, that tells you how many subshells can be in it. Just one. So that's going to be S and how many electrons are in an in a, in a S subshell? Just two because there's only one orbital. Now when we go to two, we, now we have two S and we now we have two P. P is the new subshell that we're allowed now because we're, we're in the second level. S has two, P has how many electrons? How many electrons can we find in a, in a, in a P subshell? Isn't it six? It's six, right. 2P6, two plus six is eight. And so on, when we get to three, then we have three S, we have three P, and now we have the third subshell, three D. S has two, P has six, and how many does D have? 10. 10. 2 plus 6 plus 10 is 18. And then basically, once we get to 4, we have all four subshells, and then we have 32 electrons. And then same is true for 5 and 6 and, and 7. 32 is basically the maximum number. That's also one of the reasons why um, people want to build all these new super large um, uh, atoms to see if this holds up when we get to like really large number of electrons. But, but all, all of the elements we've seen so far, we've S, P, D, and F are enough to define all of the elements so far. So quickly, I just wanna sort of get to I'm going to get to the periodic table. These are all the weird shapes. All right, so this is what the what our energy levels um, look like. I, I, I'll, I'll I'll post these in case in case you I'll post these slides in, in case you want to to uh, to see them. So this just gives you a rundown of what all the different when n is one, when n is two, when n is three, these are all the principal, these are all the shells. So remember, these are sub shells first, and then sub levels or sub shells, and then orbitals, and then finally spin. So this breaks, breaks them all down. And so the order which we fill these in looks 
complicated at first. I could say, so there's no way to, to memorize this, right? So we start with 1s, we go to 2s, then we go to 2p, and then 3s and 3p. There's no way to, to, to memorize this. So what we do is we just draw a table. This is the table we draw here. So just make a table, s, oops, s, p, d, and f going this way, and then all principal numbers are the shells going down this way. And all you have to do is just go on the diagonal, and that gives you the order, okay? The other way to know the order, it's actually a lot easier. Let me see if I can. We get to the periodic table. This is the other way to figure out how it works. If you just look at the periodic table, basically the periodic table tells you just by looking at it, the order in which these things are arranged. So if we look at, so hydrogen is here, there's hydrogen, then there's helium. So we start with 1s, 1, because hydrogen has one electron, and we move this way across the periodic table. The next thing we come to is helium. That adds a second electron. Then we go all the way back, and now we have 1s, 2, 2s, 1. And then we add another one to 2s. So now we have 1s, 2, 2s2, and then we go all the way across the periodic table. And what do we start filling now? P. And then once we filled all these P orbitals, we go all the way back again, and we start with 3s. And then we go to 3p, and we come all the way back. We start at 4s. Now we start filling 3d and so on. So if you just have a, if you just have a periodic table, you can work out the order that all these are filled in. And that's why we call this the S block. Groups one and two, we call the S block. Groups 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 are the P block because they're defined by electrons going into the P. These are the transition met metals as we start filling in the D block. And then these are the rare earth metals. Usually these are, usually you see this block down below the periodic table. But if you were to put it back into the periodic table where it, where, it, where it should go, this is where it would go. And so if you just look at the periodic table, that tells you the order we fill in electrons, okay? So do people have some, some, some must have some questions about this. I went, went through things rather quickly. Yeah, um, for the P block in the video, it was saying how you have to do the arrows like all the way up um, first and then all the way down versus like up, down, up, down. Is mm -hmm. that only the case for P? No, that's always the case. So let me show you. So when we're filling, when we're filling in, um, let's say we're, we're filling in, uh, let's see what, so let's go 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. What element would that be? Phosphorus? Oh no, nitrogen? Yeah, it's got seven. We'd have seven electrons, right? So seven electrons. So when we would put these, when we make it what we, what we call an orbital diagram, this is called the electron configuration, right? So that just tells you basically how many electrons it has, but it doesn't give you a good idea of where exactly they are. Now, when you draw an electron, when you draw a, a, a orbital diagram, basically you show where the electrons are. So let's do that. So we have 1s2, 2s2, and 2p2. So 1s, so we start adding electrons one at a time. So 1, 
two, three, four. And then P, remember, is three orbitals. And we, so how do we put the electrons in? Do we put them in, where, where do we put the first one? So we've got three electrons to put in this 2P subshell. Where do we put the first one? Oh, yeah. oh. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll put in the um, I'll put in the the the, um, the quantum numbers here. So we have minus one, zero, and plus one. So where where does where does the first electron go? Minus one, zero, or plus one? Which which orbital do we put it in? Minus one. Mm-hmm. Yep, and since it's the first one in, which direction? Spinning up or spinning down? Up. Up, right. So we, we put it in spinning up. Now, where does the second one go? Remember, we have three electrons to put in there. Where does the second one go? Zero up. Mm-hmm, yep. And the third one? And then um, one up. Plus one up. Now, we have three electrons. Now, this is... This is the principle that you can't have two electrons in the same orbital until all the orbitals are filled, right? I think that's that's the the that's not off brow. I can't remember which one it is. All of a sudden, which one is the? It's the Pauli exclusion principle. There you go. Um, yeah, basically, you can't add another electron together until you filled all the electrons. Now, why is that? Remember, electrons are negatively charged. They're not going to want to be in the same space unless there's literally no place else for them to go. So these three in the 2P will be as far away from each other as they, as they possibly can because they're negatively charged. They repel each other. Once we add another electron, then it has to go into one of these uh, places. So. One thing I want you to notice is that this is nitrogen, right? How many, um, so when nitrogen gets a charge, what charge does it have? When nitrogen is negatively charged, what charge is it? Basically, how many electrons does it need? Negative. Additional electrons does it need to get to a completely filled shell and look like a, a noble gas configuration? So three more? Three more, right. So when nitrogen is a negative ion, it's a minus three. And where do those three electrons go? They go right here. One, two, three. So then it fills up and now it's completely filled. Every orbital is filled and so it looks like neon. Neon has 10 electrons and all um, orbitals are completely filled. Now let's do the same thing but with oxygen. So how many electrons does oxygen have? Eight. Yep. So where are they? So let's, so we have one S2, two S2, two P. How many in the two P? Four. Four, right. So let's draw the orbital diagram for oxygen. 1s, 2s, 2p. So here's our 1s, 2s, and there's our 2p with one, two, three places for orbitals. Minus one, zero, plus one. So we got eight electrons. So we go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now remember, that's what nitrogen looks like, but oxygen is one more. Oxygen is eight electrons. Where does the eighth electron go? Under negative one. Mm -hmm. Now notice we have two unpaired electrons in oxygen. Now when oxygen 
has a negative charge, when oxygen is, is an ion, what charge does oxygen have? Negative two. Negative two. And where do you think those go? They go right here. One, two. Oxygen, O2. So in order then, for, oh, go ahead. For, so for, in order for oxygen to be an ion, it would have to have a charge of negative two? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this explains why. So that's, 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 that's the nice thing about these orbital diagrams. It explains perfectly why does oxygen have a, why does oxygen when it's an ion have a, have a, has a charge of minus two? This is why. Why does fluorine have a charge of minus one? Always minus one. Well, because fluorine has nine electrons. So that ninth electron is here. Oops, wrong color. So is there such thing as oxygen with a charge of negative one? Yes, but I will. Um, So yeah, so fluorine looks like this. So it's got two, four, and then five electrons. No, so, sorry, two, 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 and five. So it has nine electrons. So it has room for only one more electron. And so when it has a negative charge, it adds it here. And so fluorine can only accept one more electron and then its orbitals are all filled. And that's why fluorine is minus one. So all of the halogens in the last group before you get to the double gases, when they're ions, they're all minus one. Fluorine, chlorine, iodine, bromine, they're all minus one. Why? Because they all have one space in the p orbital, in the p subshell for an electron to go. Now for fluorine, that's in 2p. For bromine, that's in 3p. For iodine, that's in 4p, and so on and so on, and then 5p and 6p. That's why they're all minus one. And the same is true for oxygen. Oxygen, two left in, in, in 2p. And then you go to sulfur, two left in 3p, and you keep going down, okay? So let's, any other questions before we go back to the, to the, I like this. We're having a nice discussion before we go back to the, before we go back to the, the the recitation. Is there anything else that that confuses you about what's going on? I imagine most things. Um, uh, uh, while I was doing the um, sampling assignment mm -hmm. this week, and I was doing one of the problems. Uh, mm -hmm. If I remember correctly. It, me uh what was the question said like based the question said a ground state hydrogen absorbs a photon with a wavelength of like 93.7 oh right yeah there. a lot of people have yeah. trouble with that yeah mm -hmm. that one and um i did that i um i had a two to happen with that one and eventually i solved it but i wasn't sure why and when i saw the solution uh, it showed that the Ryberg equation was used um, uh, with the n squared initial uh, minus the one over n squared final. But mm -hmm. in the lecture notes, uh, she showed it as uh, r parentheses one over n squared final minus one over n squared initial. I, I was just really confused. Yeah, her, her equation is correct, and, and the, the, the equation that, that was given to you is incorrect. Oh, okay, so, oh, wow, okay, that's surprising. Oh, wait a minute, no, let me, let me look. Um, let me, let's, let's go back to the, Rin, let's go back to the Rinberg equation, because that's, that's, that's what you need to, to, to solve that. All right, let's just go back. Oops. Yeah, I wouldn't spend too much time worrying about, about that, but 
since it is since it was in the Greenberg, here we go. Since it was in 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 the homework, I guess we do have to to to, to think about it. So yeah, so N one would be um, the initial, N two is the final. And so why is it that way? Because N two is always going to be larger. And so since N2 is always going to be larger, the reciprocal is always going to be smaller. And so basically this will give you a positive, oops. This will give you a positive number. So this number is going to be larger than this number. But when you take the reciprocal, this number is going to be smaller. Right, so if, so if, if N1 is initial and you go from one to two, then this is gonna be one minus one over two squared, which is four. So that gives you three quarters. So, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so it's N2, N squared I minus, one over N squared I minus one over N squared F, not the other yep. way around. Yep. Okay. Yeah. yeah, because yeah, because that that way you get a, you get a positive number, and this has to be a positive number because all energy is positive. So yeah, you have to get some some kind of positive number here. So remember, just just convert. So just to answer that question, all you need to do is convert that um, uh, wavelength to meters, and then plug it in there. Oh, uh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. But yeah, again, that's, that's the sort of problem that like, I don't think, I mean, it may be a, on a test somewhere, but I kind of doubt it. Because really, it's, it's sort of missing the point. The important thing is, is to know how the periodic table works. I mean, to me, that's, that's a lot more important than getting bogged down with, with, with this kind of stuff. But, but it was on the homework. So I guess we do have to worry about it. <laughs> Okay, any, any other questions before we start looking at the, at the, the recitation? I guess we can also ask questions during the recitation as well. All right. When so, she, oh. Go ahead. When she did, when she used that equation in an example, I think in the video, I think she used the version where F was first and I was second, and it, she ended up with a positive answer. Hmm. Well, really? Because I think, Professor. Yes. So uh, I can take a crack at this. So if the equation that you use is n final minus n initial, then the number that you get is negative, and so the version where you have the final um, first, there's a negative in front of r. In this in this equation mm. here, there's no negative because you know that the answer is going to be positive. Right. So that's, yeah. that's the adjustment. And it all depends which you define as the initial and, and, and the final. Um, I guess, I mean, I, I think of the initial as where the higher energy is, and then when it falls back, that's, that's, that's the final. So it starts with a higher number, and then ends with a smaller number. So, yeah, I mean, that's so, the, so the, the larger number would always go second, and the smaller number would always go first depending on how, how you want to look at it. Yeah, it just depends how the, how the, how the equation's set up. So the way, I, the way I think about it, it's like this. But yeah, you could switch them around. I mean, basically you're gonna get the same answer, but just one will be positive and one will be negative. Well, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> but like I said, I don't, don't, don't worry too much of, of, about this. I mean, maybe worry a little bit about this, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I think more about the, the large picture. So let's, let's look at some of, the, some of our problems. All right. All right, we'll do we'll, we'll do a few of these together and then and then break out to sort sort of like we did last week. So, atomic model. 
Um, so we'll, we'll just do this one together. So we have four different groups of, of atoms and ions. Which species have the same number of protons? The one with all S's. Need more information than that. Uh, D. What does all what does S stand for? Um, sulfur. Sulfur, right. So why why is it D? Um, because they all have this. They're all the same element. Exactly. Yeah, they're all sulfur. It doesn't matter how many. So what's the only difference between S S minus two and S plus two? The charge. The, the charge, and so. If the charges are all different, why are the charges all different? What's different about them that makes the charge different? The number of electrons. Right. It's always the number of electrons. If you change the number of protons, what happens to your atom? It becomes a different element. Exactly. So, yeah, so immediately when you look at that, just go, just focus right in it. Well, it's got to be this. Because if it's the same number of protons, that means it's the same element. It might be a different ion. That could be, but it's got to be the same element if it all has the same um, same number of protons. So if it's the same number of protons, the same element's got to have the same uh, symbol. Now, which of them have the same number of electrons? And we basically know that ain't going to be D, right? Because they all have different numbers of electrons. as I desperately look for my periodic table. Woo I think someone took my periodic table. Um, I think it's A. Oh, here it is. All right, how many does each one have? Um, A, each one has 10 electrons. 10, right. So. We would say that these, when you have the same number of electrons, we say that these are all isoelectronic. Iso meaning same. Electronic, oh, oops. Isoelectronic. Right, so each of these elements is in its most stable conformation. Why? Well, F, fluorine, has nine electrons, and it adds one more to get to 10. So it has a negative charge, then it looks like neon. Well, neon already has 10 electrons, so it is super, super stable because it has a full 1s, a full 2s, and a full 2p. It is complete. So its first and second shells are completely filled. That's why it's so stable. That's why it's, 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 it's a noble gas. When all of your orbital, when all of your shells are completely filled, then you have, you, you've achieved chemical nirvana. You are the most stable. Now, magnesium, how many, how many um, electrons does magnesium atom have? Twelve. Twelve. So, for grins, let's see what... If we were to draw an orbital diagram for magnesium, what would it look like? So first, what would what would be the what would be the um, the um, where are the electrons in? We have twelve. So magnesium has twelve. So what would be when I started drawing out the one s two, two s two? What's what's comes after that? Two p six. Mm hmm. And then and what's next? 3s2. Three, 3s2, three three excellent. So when we draw the orbital diagram, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and then we finally have 3s2 up here. One, two. Now, so 1s, 2s, 2p, 
3S. Now, what would magnesium have to do to get completely filled shells? So it has, so shell one is completely filled. Shell two is completely filled and equals two. And then it has two electrons in shell number three. What would it need to do to have completely filled shells at this point? To, it would have to gain 16 electrons or lose two. There you go. Yeah, so shell number three holds 18 electrons. Now what do you think would be easier to do? Gain 16 more electrons or just lose these two? Lose. Lose two, right. So it just spits out both of these. And then, so it gets rid of those. Now it has two completely filled shells, but also a two plus charge. Now look and see which group magnesium is in. Which group is magnesium in? My periodic table doesn't have that, so I have to Google it. <laughs> well, so it's, which 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 um, um, column is it in? One, second. two, three, four. second. So which group is that? If it's in the second column, it's group. Oh, it's just group two. Group two. Oh, I thought it had a name. So why do we, why is why do we put all these elements into group two? Well, because they all look like this. So beryllium has, looks like this. Beryllium has four electrons. It's two, it's second um, two are in 2s. So it gets rid of 2s and becomes beryllium two plus because then it has a completely filled 1s shell. Now when we get to, what's, what's the next one down? So we have beryllium, magnesium, what's the next one down? Calcium. Calcium also takes on a two plus charge. Why? Because it has a four S. It has a completely filled shell number one, shell number two, and shell number three, and then two electrons in four S. So it loses those and becomes two plus. And the next one down, strontium has two electrons in G. I guess you'll never guess where. 5s, and it has a full shell of one, two, three, and four. And so it has two electrons left in 5s, and so kicks those out. Barium, where do you think its two electrons are? It's out of two outermost electrons are. 6s. 6s, exactly. And so that's why they all react so similarly, because they all have two electrons in their outermost shell. What is another word we use for electrons in an outermost shell? Valence electrons? Valence electrons, exactly. Valence electrons. It's those electrons in the outermost shell, basically the outermost shell that isn't filled completely. So, you look at fluorine, fluorine has 2s, 1s, 2s, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So it has 2s, 2p, 2 plus 5, 7 valence electrons. And so it needs only one more to get the chemical nirvana which is a completely filled shell. So it has a negative charge. On the other hand, if you go all the way to the other end of the periodic table, you've got sodium that looks like this. So sodium now has 11 electrons. It's shell number one is filled 
its shell number two is filled, and it has only one electron in 3s. So what's the simplest way for sodium to get to a very stable con electron configuration? Lose that. And then it goes back to looking like neon. So basically that pretty much, um, that's like 90% of, of chemistry, is figuring out where are you on the, on the periodic table, what does your chemical, what is, what is your electron configuration look like? And how do I, how does that element get to a noble gas configuration? If it's on the right side of the periodic table and has a lot of, of valence electrons, it adds more. If it's on the left side of the periodic table and has very few valence electrons, it loses them and becomes positively charged. So that's basically, if you, if you can get that, you're like, you know, like I said, you're like 90% of the way home in, in figuring these things out, okay? All right, let's go back to the... Uh, where is... Oh, here's our recitation. All right, so then we... So basically, this is just a review of our uh, orbital designations that we've sort of gone over already. But just to review one more time. So remember, N, that's the shell. This is the way I like to think about it because it, it, it sort of sticks in my head. So it goes shell, subshell. So L is subshell. M is orbital. And spin is just spin. So N is the shell. How far away is that electron? One, two, three, four, five. Which sub which subshell can be in any particular one? And you figure that out by just subtracting one from N. So if N is two, that means you're gonna have two subshells. What are the what are the numbers? Zero and one. Why? Because it goes from zero to N minus one. So S is zero, P is one, S, P, D, F, zero, one, two, three. And then the orbital, remember, we can always figure out how many orbitals there are by just remembering what L is. If L, if, remember, D, what's the, what, what's the angular momentum uh, number for D? What's the subshell number for D? Try to remember the order it goes S, P, D, F, or special puppies deserve food. That, that's, that, that's how I remember it. So when special puppies deserve food, so that we just put their numbers by them. Zero, one, what's D gonna be? Two. Not zero. Two. Two. And what's F gonna be? Zero, one, two, three. Three, right. So since special puppies deserve food, we just go zero, one, two, three. That is the value of L. So that tells you the sub, what kind of subshell is it. And we can always figure out how many orbitals there are just using this number. So if D equals two, that immediately tells us we start at minus two and then minus one, and then zero, and then plus one, and plus two. Because the number of orbitals always goes from minus L out to plus L. So S is zero, so you're done. There's no minus zero and plus zero, it's just zero. So that means there's only zero. There's only one place to go. And the address of that place is zero. So its orbital number is zero. For D though, we've got, when it's, because L is two, it tells us we've got zero, and then plus one and plus two, plus one and minus one, and then minus two and right, plus two. That gives us one, two, three, four, five places. Okay, so shell, subshell, orbital, spin. And you can only have two electrons in each one. So, 
how many orbitals can have the following designation? So we'll do one of these. Actually, we'll do like a couple. And then we'll just go off and then come back. So if n equals 6, can l equal 5? No. Now, this is tricky because some textbooks will say that, yes, you can have S, P, D, F, G, H, and I, but they don't appear on the periodic table. There's no, there's no, you know, G block and H block and I block. So it depends whether they're saying like theoretically it's possible, but, but realistically it isn't because there is no, so zero, one, two, three, four, five. There is no six H uh, so subshell. L can only equal zero, one, two, or three. As far as I'm concerned, you may want to ask uh, um, the professor what, what, what she thinks, um, because some different people have different takes on this. Um, because I've seen it in, in, in textbooks where they say, yeah, there's, there's such a thing as a 7i orbital because, you know, you get to i, that's 6, and so 6 is one less than 7, so it's theoretically possible. But I don't see the point of that because there's no such thing. So I would say, and you might want to, again, check, check with the professor, I would say no orbitals can have that designation because L only goes up to th three. There's only S, P, D, and F, and there ain't no more. But that is a point of contention, like I said. Theoretically, you can get larger ones, but practically, we haven't found them yet. So what about at N equals six? <clears throat> How many orbitals could we find with n equals six. How would we answer that question? What's the first thing we'd wanna do? What does, n, what does n equals six mean? That means there's six electron shells? It's the sixth electron shell. So n equals six means it is the sixth electron shell. So how many, so the next thing, what would, what would be the next thing we need to, to find out? So, because we need to figure out how many orbitals there are. So we know we're in the sixth shell. How many subshells are there in the sixth shell? Now remember, our subshells are S, P, D, and F. So how many of those would we find in the sixth shell? Oops. Would it be twice over? going on here. Just give me a, give me a second. I sort of had a meltdown. Okay. Go back. There we go. All right. So we are in the sixth shell. And our four orbitals we can have are S, P, D and F. So how many subshells can we have in the sixth shell? So when n equals six, 
L, which is remember, L is the so N is the sub is the shell, L is the subshell. And it goes up, it can be a number as big as n minus one. So we can have a number as big as five. But, but L could be zero, one, two, or three. So how many subshells do we have in the sixth shell? Five. Remember, there's only four of them. So the most we can have is four. These are all the ones there are. Maybe two. Why do you say two? Which two? I don't know. That's just a guess. <laughs> What's the n minus one? N minus one is the very largest number it can be. So that's the maximum number for L possible. However, there is only L equals zero, one, two, or three. That's it, there isn't any, there isn't any more. So if the maximum it could be is five, how many subshells do we have? So basically we can have S, we can have S and P, we can have S, P, and D, or we can have S, P, D, and F. So it'd be two because five minus Three. Where's the five minus three? Where are you getting that from? Like from the F because you, you can, L can only be zero, one, two, or three. And then, but then you said L was five. So then. Is well, it three? So the, what, what this means is when N equals six, Basically, it can contain all of the subshells up to n minus one. So it can contain zero, it can contain one, it can contain two, it can contain three, but then that's it. So there's only these four. So how many would S, would n equal six? How many different subshells could it have in it? Four. Four, right. Once so, so when n equals one, we could only have l equals zero because it could, could only be n minus one. So the only subshell in, in in the first shell is s. That's it. When we go to the second, when n equals two, we can have l equals zero and one. So we can have s plus p. When we go to n equals three, l can be zero, one or two. So it will contain S plus P plus D and so on. So the first shell has one subshell. The second shell has two subshells. The third shell has three subshells. The fourth shell has four subshells. And then four just stays the maximum number after that. So N equals six has six S, six P, 6D and 6F. So those are the four subshells that um, the, the six, <laughs> man, it's like Sally sells she sells at the seashore. Those are the six subshells <laughs> that the sixth shell shares. There you go. Get, get, get all my alliteration in there. So it's got four subshells. Same would be true with four, five, six, and seven. They all have four. So, the, but the question is how many orbitals can there be? So the, really the question is how many orbitals are in 6s plus p plus d plus f? How do we figure that out? How many orbitals does s have? Sure. Well, let's figure it out. We, we can figure it out from their L values. So the L values for each of these, these are the L values, zero, one, two, three. Now we use the L values, the angular values, to determine how we can use those numbers to figure out how many subshells or how many, how many orbitals 
sorry, how many orbitals are in each subshell? Because the orbitals go from minus L to plus L. That's how we can figure it out. So 6S is zero. So we can go from minus zero to plus zero. So basically zero. Zero is the only orbital it has. So how many orbitals is that in S? One. One, exactly. So 6S has one. Now go to 6P. Now 6P, L for P equals one. So what are the three orbit, what, oh, I already gave it away. So what, what are the orbital addresses for that? Remember, it goes from minus L to plus L. So it can be minus one, zero, and plus one. So how many orbitals is that? Three. Three. And then when L equals two for D, it can go minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, plus two. How many orbitals is that? Five. Five. And remember, so remember, every time we add, every time we, we, we increase L, we add two orbitals on either side. So we go from zero, minus one, plus one, and then minus two, plus two, and then minus three, plus three. So every time it gets two bigger. So when we get to F, it can be, when L equals three now, it can be minus three, minus two, minus one, plus two, plus two, plus three. So it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So six F has seven. So we just add the number of orbitals together. How many orbitals is that? 16. 16. 16 orbitals. How many electrons total can that be? What's the maximum number of electrons we could stuff in there? Thirty-two. Thirty-two. That's right, because each one of those orbitals has room for two electrons. So the maximum number of electrons we can have in any shell is thirty-two. Okay, let's do. Uh, oh, there's five. Oh, two D. Here we go. So n equals two. So what can L equal? What are my values of L I can have? Two. So I can have two different values of L. So what are they? Remember, I can only go out to n minus one. Oh, so zero and one. Zero and one, right. Zero and one. So what subshells are those, zero and one? S and mm -hmm. P. S and P. So can we have a 2D subshell? No. No. Nope. So how many orbitals can have that? None. That's how many. Because there's no such thing as 2D. Very good. All right, let's do... Do the two C. So n equals three. So we're in the third shell. And L equals two. So which subshell is that? D. Right. S P D. So it's the third one. Zero, one, two. So that is three D. Mm-hmm. So is there any of these you'd like to, uh, to uh, review a little bit more before we sort of break off and then come back? Uh, I'm so confused as how you find the number of orbitals again based on uh, N and L. I still don't understand that part. Okay. Can we like so. draw it out or? So N equals shell, L equals subshell. And m to the l equals orbital. 
So we take a look at, let's say, um, let's look at 2D. So n equals five, so it automatically tells us which shell that is, right? So we just, that's five. So L equals zero. Which subshell is that? S. 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 Right. And since S has a, a value of for L of zero, if you want to figure out how many how many orbitals are in it, remember the number of orbitals or m to the l can go from minus l <clears throat> out to plus l. So in other words, if if L equals zero, it can go from minus zero to plus zero. Well, there is no minus zero and plus zero. So the only value it can have is zero. So M to the L can only be zero. And that's, so that's the address of one orbital. So remember M to the L goes from minus L to plus L. And zero is one of those numbers it can be. But so zero means that's the orbital address and it can only be one. So that's it, it's just zero. So if we were to write out, um, so for 5S, if we were to write out all the, all four quantum numbers, we would start with N equals five, L equals zero, M to the L equals zero, and then the spin, M to the S would either be plus one half for the first electron going in there or minus one half for the second one going in there. So for S, L and M to the L are the same number, zero. What? That's, that's, that's not doing it for you? Not for me. Uh, not really. Okay. Yeah. Let's... Now, let's do, let's say um, we are 3P. Three, three okay, so N equals 3, right? What does L equal? L is your P. So this is the shell, there's your subshell. So what value of L do we give for subshell P? Is it three? Nope. Three is three is N. Three is the shell number. What's the subshell number? L. Two. Nope. One. Mm-hmm. So we go. S member, special puppies deserve food. So these are the four subshells. And their values of L are zero, one two, three, because the highest number it can have is n minus one. So we, so the, the lowest number it can have is zero and the highest number we go to is three. So P zero one, so that is L. So P equals one, L equals one when it's a P orbital. So L in this instance equals one. Now that tells us, this tells us the shell. This tells us the subshell. Now the orbital is defined by N to the L. Now, what are the possible values of M to the L? Well, they go from minus L all the way out to plus L. Now in this instance, with a P orbital, our L is equal to one. So what's the smallest value of M to the L we can have? Negative one. Negative one, that's right. What's the next value it can have? What, what's the maximum value it can have? One. One, plus one. Plus one. And so, there's a number in between minus one and plus one. What's that? Zero. Zero. So those are the three possible values you can have for the orbitals inside a P subshell. 
How many orbitals is that? Just count them. One, two, three. And since there's three sub, whoops, three. Since there's three subshells, that means there's room for two, four, six electrons. But making any more sense? I know this. This takes a while this to to sink in. A little bit. Yeah, but this this is this is the way I I still use this to this day to to figure this out. I mean, either you can memorize, you know. Special puppies deserve food, and you can just memorize that, you know, it's 2, 6, 10, and 14, but I'd much rather understand it. And the way to understand it is that since L is 0, 1, 2, and 3, if I can go from minus L to plus L, that automat then I don't need to memorize anything. I can just, rem I just know that with P, I can go minus 1, zero plus one. With D, I can go minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, plus two. And with F, since it's three, I can go to minus three, minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, plus two, plus three. So that's three orbitals in P, five orbitals in D, and seven orbitals in F. Um, where did the 2, 6, 10, and 14 come from? Those are the number of electrons that can go in each one. Oh, okay. Yeah. So when, so when, we're, so when we're doing our electron configuration, we go 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and you know, so on as, as we go across. So these are completely filled subshells would have that many electrons in them. But the way to the way to remember so instead of memorizing that because I hate memorizing anything I don't I don't like memorization because it's not learning learning is better than memorization understanding is better than memorization if you can understand why it has the, the d orbital has has or d subshell has uh, ten electrons in it if you know why that is that's much better than memorizing it's got ten because it's easy to forget things that, that you memorize. It's much harder to forget things you understand, at least for me. All right, so, so shall, we, shall we break into little groups for a while? Because we only, well, actually we don't really have that much time. So why, why, we'll just skip that for today. And why don't we just, um, let's do, let's look at number three. Because these are designations for electrons. So these are basically addresses for electrons. And that's all, um, that, that's all these quantum numbers are, or addresses. Think of it as a zip code. A zip code with four numbers in it. It's got N, it's got L, it's got M to the L, it's got M to the S. All those four numbers together can define any electron. So it's all just an electron address. It just tells you where it is. That's it, that's all it's doing is telling you where it is. So N equals four, L equals two, M to the L equals zero. How many different electrons can be in that address? Now remember, no two electrons can have all four numbers exactly the same. That is, so no two electrons could have the same value of N and L and M to the L and M to the S. Because when you get to the last one, it's either plus one half or minus one half. That's it. You can only have two electrons in there. So if I have N equals four, L equals two, M to the L equals zero, basically what I'm, what I'm given, I know what the shell is. I know what the subshell is. Which subshell is this? P or D? D. D, right. So this is 4D. And so let's draw out. So if we were to draw where that is, so that would be 4D. And 4D has how many um, orbitals in it? Remember, L equals 2. 
So what are my, what are my potential values of m to the L? As five. As five, right, it can be minus two. So let's draw them out, one, two, three. Oh, is that where the 10 came in? Because there's five like boxes and then two electrons in each? Exactly, exactly. So, and, and so these are the addresses. These are the m to the L, minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, plus two. So it's in, so this electron address is 4D, m to the L equals zero. So it's this one. It's that precise orbital. How many electrons can be in there? This space right here. Two? Two. Yeah, exactly. And that's it. That's the, that's the maximum number. Because that's true for any orbital. It doesn't matter which orbital it is. It could be an orbital in S or an orbital in P or, or a D or an F. It doesn't matter. If it's one orbital, you can have a maximum of two electrons in it. Total. That's it. You can't have any more. So let's look at uh, D. So in this one, we have N equals 6, L equals 1. So what's what subshell is that? P. P, right, that is 6P. So let's draw out 6P. How many orbitals are gonna be in the P subshell? Since L, since L equals one, M to the L can have how many values? Three. Three, minus one, zero, plus one. Here they are. Minus one, zero, and plus one. So it's six P M to the L is minus one. So it's this one right here. And M to the S is minus one half. So which electron is that? The first one or the second one? The one on the left or the one on the right? On the right. That's right, exactly. It's this one. Because the first one in is an m to the s of minus one, or sorry, plus one half. That's this one. And the second one in always has a minus. So the spin of that one is minus one half. So how many electrons could have all four of those um, quantum numbers? One. Just one. And that's true of any four quantum numbers, like I said before. Each one of those, each one of these is an address. And there's four different numbers that go into that address. But no two electrons can have four numbers exactly the same. So that goes for any four quantum number. It doesn't matter what they are. If you're given four quantum numbers, that is the unique address of only one electron. That, that describes only one electron. So by looking at that, you didn't even need to draw this out. You've got four quantum numbers automatically, that's one, it can only be one. Now what about 2P? How many electrons can have the 2P designation? Six. Six, right, there's, there's room for six electrons in there. So there's six different electrons can say that they're 2P. Because when you draw it out, Minus one, zero, plus one, one, two, three, four, five, six. They're all 2p electrons. Now this one's a little trickier. Did she go into what shapes these are? Because I sort of skipped past that. So 2px, do you know what that means? This will be important later when we're talking about multiple bonds. But do you, do, you, do you know what shape the p orbitals have? Anyone remember what they look like? Like two balloons put together. Exactly, yeah, they look like this. And they're sort of above and below a straight line. And so, and how many p orbitals are there? Three. Three, right, and these are what the, these are what they look like. So 
but a different color. So the, that, that's the first one. It's the second one, which goes in and out of the plane. And the third one goes along this axis. So they're all one, two, three. They're all at 90 degrees from each other. That's the maximum. Since remember, electrons are negatively charged, they want to be as far away from each other. And so at 90 degree angles, they get to be as far away from each other as, as, as possible. And so you have P to the X, which is this one going in this direction. You have P to the Y going up and down in this direction. And then you have P to the Z going in and out in this direction. So there's three different P orbitals. Um, PX, PY, and PZ. So how many electrons can we put in the 2PX orbital? Remember, it's an orbital. So by definition, an orbital contains how many, can, can have two, how many electrons? Two. Two. Yep, two. Now, like I said before, this shape will become really important later on when we're talking about double bonds and triple bonds. So sort of, if you could just stick that in your mind, um, how the P orbitals are arranged is really important uh, chemically. When we get into like, you know, um, D and F, the shapes of those are so bizarre that, you know, it's kind of, I, I, I can't even think about them, let alone draw them. But at least, you know, balloon animals with a knot in the middle. Okay, I, I, I can understand that. Because yeah, D and F, especially F, there's some just bizarre shapes uh, in F. And I think that's the, what, one of the reasons why uh, rare earth and transition metals are so weird because they, they have these weird orbitals. But this will come up a lot. Who's heard of pi bonds? Anyone remember pi bonds from, from the last chemistry class you took? In high school, yeah, but that was like four years. Okay, so what, <laughs> what is a pi bond? Do you remember? Uh, nah. What's a sigma bond? So there's two types of bonds. We have sigma bonds and we have pi bonds. You don't, you don't remember those? No. Okay. So a sigma bond is any single bond between any two, any two um, atoms. And then a pi bond is the second or third, whoops, second or third bond. So if you have a double bond, one of them is going to be sigma and the other one is going to be a pi. If you have a triple bond, one of them is going to be a sigma and two of them are going to be a pi. And the reason they're called pi bonds is that they're made with these P electrons. And because they're made with these P electrons, they have very specific shapes. So we'll get to that in, in another chapter, but that's something to sort of like stick back um, in your head, the 90 degree orientation of the P orbitals, because it'll become, it isn't just some sort of, you know, weird uh, Schrodinger mathematics thing. It actually has real consequences for, for, for chemistry. All right. So this is just another look at what I sort of mentioned before, that if you just have a periodic table, you automatically know what the, uh, what the order is that these electrons go in. So look, thank you, Amy. So look at these electron configurations and tell me what's the problem What's the problem with this first one? You can't have one S2 and two S2? Definitely can. Oh, is it the P7? What's wrong with that? Um, you can only have up to P6. That's right. Yeah, six. So P only has room. So that if we look at the number of, whoops, if we look at the number of, um, if you look at your periodic table, 
there's two in the S block, there's six in the P block, there's 10 in the D block, and there's 14 in the F block. That tells you how many electrons there are in each one of those subshells. You just look at the periodic table. If you forget, if you're panicking on a test or something, oh my God, how many electrons can go in D? Look at the periodic table. It automatically will tell you. The periodic table knows all. That's why I, you know, that's why I say if you have a periodic table in front of you, 80% of, of the stuff you need to know for chemistry is right there. You don't really need to know much of anything else. So automatically, seven ain't gonna fly because there's only six elements in the P block. Once we fill up the P with six electrons, then we move on, we're gone. So we can't have seven in there. What about this one? What about B? What's wrong with that? Is there something wrong with it? The S can only be S2. Right. Yeah, you can't have, there's only two elements in the S block. Two. So we can't have three, because the minute we fill up S, where do we go? Move across the periodic table when S is filled, where do we go? To 3P. We go to 3P, right. So we can't have three S3. That's no good. What about uh, the third one, C? Is there a problem there? D12 can only go up to 10. You can only go up to 10, right. There's only 10 elements in the D block. We can have 12. In a, in a D. We can have 12 in an F because F has room for 14. So we could have 12 in, a, in an F um, subshell, but we can't have it in a D. So that's not going to work. What about the last one? There's nothing wrong with it. Yeah, that's fine. That's that's completely that's completely fine. Would that uh, be um, argon? Let's count them up. So we got two, four, ten, eighteen. Yeah, that's got eighteen electrons. That is argon. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it has all of its all of its subshells are full and so it is fine. Let's, uh, let me clear this out. All right, no, oops. So let's do a, cu a, a couple of these, we've sort of done some of these already. Let's do, we've already done oxygen and sodium, let's do chlorine. So we're gonna write the orbital diagram and the electron configuration. So we start with the electron configuration. So chlorine, just start with how many electrons does it have? 17. If I have a quick look, yes, 17. So it's 17 electrons. So remember the order, we use this to give us the order until we get the 17, all right? so. We start with 1s, and then 2s, and then 2p, and then 3s, and then 3p, until we get to 17. So let's do that. Uh, back down. Ah. I want the mouse. There we go. We need 17 electrons. So let's start filling them in. So where do we start? We always start the same thing. What's the very first place we put electrons? One S. Yep, and how many go in there? Two. Two, yep, and then where do we go next? Um, two S. How many, can, what's the max we can put in there? Two. Mm-hmm. And then two P six. Uh-huh. And then 3s2. Yep. 
And 3p5. So 2 and 2 is 4, and 6 is 10, and 2 is 12, and we need 17, so we put 5 in there. That's right. So now let's draw the orbital diagram. So let's let me share. So we need 17. So, our, so we had 1s2, 2s2, 2, and a lot of the um, periodic tables will have these for you. 2p6, 3s2, 3p5. So we start with 1s. How many orbitals in 1s? So remember, each box I'm going to draw is an orbital. So how many boxes do I put for 1s? Two? Two electrons, yes, but how many how many orbitals? One. Remember, one, right, because for every two electrons, there's only one orbital, because they share, right? 1s, 2, 1, 2, and 2s, 1, 2, and then we get to 2p, how many is that? How many orbitals in 2p? Three. Three, right. One, two. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Then we get to 3s. How many in 3s? Same as 2s, same as 1s. Yep. One, one, two. And then we get to 3p. How many in 3p? Three. Three, one, two. So when we put our three in, how am I going to put them in? You have to do the all of the ups, up, up arrows first. Right. So I go one, two, three, four, five. So then that's it. So I've got two, four, ten, twelve, plus five is seventeen. And so you can see that how many valence electrons does chlorine have? So remember, those are the outermost electrons in the outermost shell. How many does it have? Seven. That's seven, right. It's got two here and it's got five here. So there's a total of seven valence electrons. How many valence electrons does argon have? So argon is right next to it. If chlorine, chlorine is 17, argon is 18. How many valence electrons does argon have? Zero. Zero. Actually, it is eight, because it is eight in its outermost shell. Because, yeah, the number of valence electrons is just the number of electrons you have in your outermost shell. That's, that's, that's all it means. Is, so in your outermost shell has eight. So it has eight valence electrons. So chlorine, like every other element, wants to look like the closest um, noble gas. The closest noble gas is argon. So instead of 17 electrons, argon is 18 electrons. And so that's why chlorine fills this with its final electron for 18 and becomes negatively charged. So when you draw out the orbital diagrams, it becomes really Oh, stop it, you two. It becomes really quite apparent when you look at the orbital diagrams why certain elements lose electrons and become positive, become cations, and other um, elements gain electrons and become anions. Because you can see, if you only need one electron to, gain, to get to uh, noble gas configuration, you will take one from somebody else. If, on the other hand, you only need to lose one or two, to get to noble gas configuration, it's much easier to do that than, than to gain a whole bunch of other electrons. All right, let's go back. All right, so let's uh, look at number four. So number four, we're going to use the periodic table uh, for this. So how many 
So calcium, when you're, when you're answering the question of core and valence electrons, what do you, when you're looking at the periodic table, what part of the periodic table is going to tell you how many valence electrons an element has? What group it's in? Exactly. Man, you guys are sharp today. I love it. Yeah, it's determined by the group. The group number tells you how many valence electrons it has. Now, there are exceptions to this. What are, what are the exceptions to this? Will you stop it? There's a certain group that does, that doesn't work for. A certain group of elements. What, oh, what do we call those? The ones all the way on the right. Nope, works Eight. for them. Transition metals. The transition metals, excellent. Yeah, it doesn't work for the transition metals. Transition metals are tricky because the transition metals can vary how many valence electrons they have. Because, you two stop. Because they have P and D orbitals, they can move things around. Um, they can move electrons from place to place, and so they can they can take up different um, number of valence electrons. Like for instance, um, manganese can be like plus two, or sometimes it can be plus four, or sometimes it can even have a negative charge. It depends on how it how it organizes its its its, its electrons. But groups one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, we call those the main group. Have you heard this before, the main group elements? Those are all the elements that aren't the transition and, and the rare earth metals. So the ones at the far right and the far left part of the table. Those are called the main group elements and they act pretty much like we would expect them to. They have the, the same number of valence electrons as the group number they're in. So let's look at Calcium. Where, where do we find calcium in the periodic table? Group two. Group two. So it's in group two. So how many valence electrons does it have? Stop it. It has two, right. Calcium has two valence electrons. So if it has two valence electrons, how many core electrons does it have? 18. Yeah, it means all the rest of them are core. You, you stop it. <laughs> hey, no. So you'll notice that pretty much that all the elements will have an even number of core electrons because the core electrons are completely filled subshells. So they're all going to be an even number. So if you, if you figure out somehow that like, you know, um, something has like 15 core electrons, that's not right. That can't be right. It has to be an even number. So calcium is 20 total. The atom is 20. And it's two of them are valence. So that means the remaining 18. What about strontium here? Where, where, where do we find strontium? Under if, calcium. If you just found, if you found calcium, strontium is going to be pretty easy to find. So if calcium is two valence electrons, how many does strontium have? Two. It has two as well. Yep. Strontium also, two valence electrons. So how many core electrons does strontium have? 36. Yep. However many total, it has 38 total. Two of them are valence, so the rest of them are going to be core. So it's 36. That's right. Very good. Uh, we just did chlorine. Let's see if you can remember how many core elect. How many? What's where do we find chlorine? Group seven. Group seven. So chlorine's in group seven. How many valence electrons does it have? Seven. Seven. It's got seven because it's in group seven. The total number of electrons chlorine has is how many? 17. So how many core? 10. 10, right. 7 plus 10 is 17. Yeah, and so you can see if you have seven valence electrons and you really want eight, you're going to take that eighth one and become negatively charged. On the other hand, if you've only got two 
valence electrons. Then you've got 36 other electrons. Well, it's pretty easy just to dump those two and be left with the 36 and just become a plus two charge because 36 is also an even number with totally filled shells. Now let's look at potassium. Where are we gonna find potassium? What group is potassium in? Group one. One, it's in group one. How many valence electrons? One. One. How many total electrons? Um, 19. Uh-huh. And so how many core electrons? Um, 18. 18. Right. So 18 looks like argon. Argon is 18. Argon is a noble gas. So potassium wants to get rid of that one electron so much that actually if you take potassium and throw it into water, what happens? It explodes. It explodes. Yeah, it explodes because it wants to get rid of that electron super bad. So it transfers that electron to water violently <laughs> and it blows up. In fact, they all blow up. Uh, lithium, not so much, but sodium explodes, potassium explodes, rubidium explodes, cesium really explodes um, because they have one electron that they desperately want to get rid of and so they can achieve stability. And so the bigger the atom is, the easier it is for it to get rid of one. It's sort of like, you know, the old, I'd like to call it the old woman who lived in a shoe uh, problem. You know, if you've got 11 kids and you lose one, well, yeah, you might notice that, like sodium, but cesium's got 55 electrons. You lose one of those, you're not really gonna you know, miss it much. And so, and you achieve stability when you lose it. So cesium is very reactive and forms an ion very readily. So, excellent. Hey, um, Professor? Yeah. Can you just briefly um, explain again what those core electrons are? Oh, sure. sure, sure, sure. So, valence electrons are the electrons involved with bonding. So, elect valence electrons are the electrons that are either given away when you become an ion, so you either lose them when you become an ion, or you share them when you become a compound. So would it so for groups one and two, they basically just lose those electrons. So they're when you're in group one and group two you lose those electrons and become ions. So group one loses one electron. That's, the, that's its valence electron, it's gone. And so whatever electrons are left, those are your core electrons. Those are the ones you hold on to. You don't share your core electrons and you don't give your core electrons away when you become ions. Why? Because your core electrons basically are completely filled subshells. Take sodium, for instance. Sodium has 11 electrons. When it loses that one, it now has 10 electrons. What element has 10 electrons? Neon. Neon is a noble gas. It's completely stable. It has filled one first shell is completely filled, second shell is completely filled. You can't get any more stable than that. It's really, really stable. In fact, neon doesn't bond with anything. It does not share its electrons with anyone under any circumstances that we, that we can tell so far um, because it's so, it's so stable. So uh, um, sodium has 11 electrons, one of them that gives away. And so that's its one valence electron. Everything else is core. Now, when you go to the other side of the periodic table, when you get to like group six and group seven, they have either six or seven valence electrons. Now, they can either give them away or they can share them. Either way, 
the number of electrons they give away or share is determined by the group number. So for instance, chlorine is in group seven. By definition, it has seven valence electrons. Valence electrons are the electrons in the outermost shell. So when we're drawing our electron uh, uh, diagrams, the box furthest away, those are the, those are the valence electrons, the one furthest away from, from, from the nucleus. Those are the valence electrons. And then you see what, which group is it in? It's in group seven, it's got seven valence electrons. Group six, it's got six. Group five, it's got five. And then all the rest, the inner electrons, the ones closer to the nucleus, those are core electrons. And those aren't going anywhere. And we'll, we'll talk more about um, core electrons and, 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 and what they do a little bit later. But right now, what, what you need to know is the group tells you the number of valence electrons. And that is for the main group elements. So not the elements in the middle, not the transition metals. Transition metals are weird and we'll get to those later. But the main groups, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, and eight. Okay? Does that work for you? Yes, thank you so much. <laughs> okay, don't <laughs> bother. No yeah, problem. I was just reading them. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's yeah. If, if if you haven't heard that before, then like yeah, like what the hell are you talking about? Core valent, core and valence electron. Yeah, it 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 fits in nicely to what we're talking about now because we're talking about where electrons are, and that's all it means. It's like if those if your electrons are far away from from the nucleus, then they're more readily lost and more readily shared with other with other elements because they're farther away. They're not being pulled on by the nucleus quite as much. So they're easier to lose. We'll find that out later when we start looking at the sizes of, of atoms. And the size of an atom can be predicted by where it is on, on the periodic table and how far away its, its, its electrons are. That, we'll, get in, we'll get into that a little bit later as well. Will that be on chapter three? Uh, no, I don't think we get to that for a while. Okay. Yeah, Thank like five or six. I can't remember exactly. We 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 switched the the um, the textbook just like a like the last year, and so the everything's been scrambled a little bit, but it fa fairly soon. We'll we'll get to it this term certainly. Thank you so much. No problem. No problem. Anybody else with a with a question? With like just wipe anything in the recitation, or with what we're currently working on right now? I'm sorry. With like anything that we've gone over in the recitation, or anything at all? Yeah, anything at all. We're all. I mean, we're all here. Okay. Uh, we're pretty much done with the recitation today because we 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 that's 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 our two hours. But if, but I, I I have some time. You want to talk about anything at all? That, that works for me. Um, I'm still having trouble figuring out how many orbitals can have a like or how to determine the number of orbitals based on n and l and okay and yeah it's hard no it's 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 because yeah it, it i think the most confusing thing is that zero is a place i mean i know that's 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 confusing for me but you know zero means none right that's mm -hmm. i mean it's it should anyway so let's just sort of go over it a little bit so we have so the quantum numbers, like I said, are just an address. And we have four, four places or four things that, that describe the location of an electron. We have N, which is the shell. That's just simply how far away from the nucleus it is. That's it. L, which subshell is it in? And those are like the weird shape uh, weird shaped things that like, electrons uh, can be. They can either be circles or the balloons or all, all that sort of weird shapes. M to the L, now we're getting down to like very, very sp specific places. Those are the orbitals. There could only be two electrons in each one. 
total. That's it. And then m to the s tells you exactly which electron it is. So the last number defines a single electron. It's either the first one in, and it's spinning up, or it's the second one to go in, and it's spinning down. So the shell tells us two things. It says, how far away from the nucleus is it? And the second thing it tells us, how many different subshells there can be. And the total number of subshells there can be is n minus one. That's the maximum number of, of subshells you can have. So let's look at subshell three, or shell number three. So if n equals three, what are the possible values of L? Zero, one, and two. There you go. Yeah, the maximum number it can be is two. So zero, one, and two are the, are the only three subshells that can exist in the third shell. And so what are they? Special puppies deserve food. Those are the four subshells. Those are the only four that we that we've that we've defined so far. And the numbers start with zero and go one, two, three. So those are our values of L. So that's it. There could, there could re, there's only four values of L. That's it. Zero, one, two, or three. So you're, that's fairly straightforward. You don't need to know any more than that. Now where it gets tricky is trying to figure out how many electrons can go into each one. And so the way I remember, and it's, you know, it's because it's, it's, it's the way that it's, it's laid out, is the orbitals are defined by m to the l. That's the address of, of each orbital inside the subshell. So the subshell can have either two or six or 10 or 14 electrons. The m to the l is the orbital tells you where exactly inside that subshell it is. And so to determine how many orbitals there are, we just look at the we just look at l. Because the only values we can have for m to the l, which is the orbital, is we start at minus l and we go to plus l. That's it. We can't have any other we can't have any other numbers. And so if L is one, which orbital is that? Which subshell is that if L is one? P. That's P. That's right. That's the P sub that's the P subshell. So when we look inside the P subshell, we want to know how many orbitals there are in the P subshell. Well, what does that mean? It means determining what possible values of M to the L can I have? Well, since L is one. L equals one. So that tells me the maximum value of m to the L is minus is plus one. The minimum value of m to the L is minus one. And the only number between plus one and minus one is zero. So I've got one, two, three values of m to the L, meaning I've got three orbitals. Okay. Hey, sir, may I ask you something? Hello? Can, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, um, I have a question. It would be possible to have this in, in, in with a draw, like in a graph, how this is going to look like. What do you mean how they're going to look like? If you have to show a, um, a graph of this, uh -huh. how it will be represent, like to have it, because it's a little abstract for me to okay. picture it. All right. Um, oh, yeah, so let's, let's think about it like this. So I've got four different, I've got my S, I've got my P, I've got my D, and I've got my F. So my values of L are zero, one, two, and three. So now, so this is my subshell here. And then these, m to the l, 
tells me which orbitals they can have. So since, and that is defined by minus L to plus L. So S is zero. The S subshell, its value for L is zero. And so it goes from zero to zero, minus zero to plus zero. One goes from minus one to plus one. Two, minus two to plus two. Three, minus three to plus three. And then, so just figure out how many unique values is that? Zero to zero, that's one. How many unique values are there from between minus one and plus one? Minus one, zero, plus one, that's three. How many unique values are there between minus two and plus two? Minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, plus two, that's five. So each time, each time uh, a new, each time we add a new value of L, we just add one negative and one positive. So S has one. P, we add one on this side, one on the other side. Now we have three. D, we add another one in this side, another one on the other side. Now we have five. Minus, when we get to three, we have minus three, minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, plus two, plus three, that's seven. So each time we're adding two orbitals, one negative and one positive. Does that make it, make it a, little, a little clearer? Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Hey. This takes a long time to <laughs> believe me. Like I said, Einstein thought this was all BS. It took him like 10 years to finally come around because like all of his friends kept saying like, you know, Albert, we got this cold. I mean, you know, all, all the equations make sense. And he's just like, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm not buying it. He wasn't buying the whole waves and particles thing. And then basically, um, when uh, Schrodinger won like a Nobel Prize and pretty much everyone in the world was saying, yeah, this dude is right. He finally came along and went, yeah, okay, you're right. So don't feel bad. If it takes you less than 10 years, you're smarter than Einstein. Uh, I have a question. Yep. Uh, seven, five, three, and one is the number of boxes the number carry, of boxes, which is or, which is which is orbitals, yes. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. And okay. each one, so how many how many electrons can we put in each orbital? Two. Two, right. So the number of electrons would be two, six, ten, and fourteen. So that's 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 where we get S two, P six. D10 and F14. That's where those numbers come from. You see it all, if you can, I like, if you have an understanding of where these come from, then I think, like, if you understand something, I think it, it, you're just retaining it a lot longer. Just trying to memorize 2, 6, 10, and 14. I, I forget things all the time. But if it's something that's like really in there, that's like, you know, stuck in my brain because I really understand it, that, I mean, you'll remember this for, you know, the rest of your life. It can, it can be just, you know, win bar bets by you know, bringing your periodic table out. Because who doesn't take their periodic table to the bar? Thank you, Professor. No problem. <laughs>